We're joined next by Eric Schmidt, co-founder of Schmidt Futures and former CEO and chairman of Google, and Alexander Wang, founder and CEO of Scale AI, for a fireside chat moderated by Derek Devine, tech reporter for The Washington Post. Please welcome to the stage Eric Schmidt, Alexander Wang, and Garrett Devine. How's everyone doing? It's funny, I didn't actually see this room, so I was like, how big of a stage are we coming out on? But this is great, um, very welcoming. Um, yeah, this is cool to do this kind of thing in person. I'm sure this, every single person who comes on stage is like, wow, we're in person. It's probably, even that is getting a little bit um, boring. But yeah, it's, thanks everyone for coming out and um, braving the real world to kind of have this conversation and make these connections. Um, you know, I think we obviously have Alex and Eric here, and they just, you know, have really interesting experience and perspectives. Um, and but I kind of wanted to start a little bit. So I, I've been covering tech for like six or seven or eight years or something. And when I started, it was like AI, 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 and every company was an AI company. And we kind of just, I kind of just stopped writing about it because I was like, ninety percent of you are talking nonsense. A lot of this is not real. <laughs> And you know, I was you know, you can follow the the kind of cutting edge of the science, and a lot of that was happening at big companies like Google. Um, but and there was some interesting things happening there. But in terms of the applications, in terms of people making money, in terms of business models being completely transformed, it you know, most of what people were pitching me, it just didn't feel real. And I think you know, the last six months or even six weeks, like some of that feels like it's really. Change and I think Eric, you mentioned Cambrian explosion as like you know a way to kind of look at maybe this moment in AI. So I mean I think the first thing I wanted to ask you both is kind of can you give us sort of a tight description of this moment and you know from a business perspective where are we right now? Kind of you know what is the opportunity? What is different about right now than maybe a year ago or five years ago? I don't know, Alex, you want to start? Yeah, I think um, I 100% agree. You know, I I, uh, I do believe we're sort of in the midst of an AI renaissance, and it's it's true if you look at any metrics. If you look at sort of um, the broad usability of the technology and how many people are actually utilizing basically the cutting edge AI in in record time. You know, I don't think there's ever been sort of a precedent of sort of the time from. AI breakthrough to it being in the hands of millions of people in the same way that stable diffusion and Dolly 2 and these, these sorts of AI uh, image generation models have enabled. And I think there's, there's a new, we're entering a new world where the models themselves are platforms. You know, this is something that actually, Eric, I think you and I uh, had talked about years ago was that like, hey, we're going to get to this world where the, the models themselves are platforms. But what that means is that now you have, you have people building on top of them in, in fully new ways and, and sort of um, you know, there's sort of this concept of, for a while, AI seemed like a application technology. And I think we're entering a phase where it's a, a sort of underlying platform technology. And I think for many people in the industry, that seemed intuitively like it was, it was going to be the case and, and that we're going to get there. But we weren't ever in a state where, you know, we had generally usable algorithms and generally useful algorithms. And so it was incredibly exciting. And then I think from a business perspective, I think we're about to see sort of this next era of of sort of explosion of productivity from an economic perspective, explosion in use cases. So uh, I think it's going to be a brave new world over the next few years. Well, let's start by congratulating you for scaling a company, right? <laughs> Thank sorry, you. For, sorry for the pun. We, uh, um, not the first time I've heard it. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, the, uh, I guess I've, I've done this so long. To me, this is just another example of how tech works. And every cycle, it feels bigger, faster, broader. It's exactly what Alex said. And the, what happened in the last five years was you had basically transformers took over you know, architecturally. Mm -hmm. And the combination of that and these extraordinarily powerful GPU-based architectures, TPU-based architectures, and these very large models have sort of now given us that next opportunity at platform. Uh, on the platform. I think the diffusion models are particularly compelling because the simple rule is that AI used to be able to analyze patterns, but if you can analyze a pattern, you can generate something. So if you can analyze the pattern and you can learn from it, you can generate it. Well, that is a very profound 
shift in paradigm right. for many, many people. I mean, if you're sort of running a business that is not obviously in AI or you, you, know, you didn't start your business thinking about AI, I mean, do you actually, should you be thinking about this and how should you be thinking about that in this moment? Well, this is what you do. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, I think now it's, it's a really, really critical moment for companies, businesses, as well as, as nations to sort of uh, really sort of realize this speed at which this technology is moving and, and fundamentally embrace the fact that they have, to, they have to reinvent themselves in the new paradigm or they're going to be left behind and someone else is going to do that reinvention. Yeah. And it's worth noting that every incumbent says this and yeah. very few incumbents do it successfully. So I was trying to figure out where the really exciting stuff is mm -hmm. aside from the big tech companies, sorry for my bias, <laughs> and the answer is the startups, right? The other large companies that are not the big tech companies are not doing this stuff because they have not been able to incorporate these new modalities, platforms, data models, and so forth into their existing data flows for whatever reason, including, for example, that they don't know where their data is or it's not normalized or it's not labeled in the right way or they can't get to it or the data center burnt down and they're not on the cloud or something stupid right. like that, um, and, all of which is possible. And it's, it's not for lack of understanding. I think you can talk to executives at these enterprises and they know that data is their fundamental blocker to getting to an AI future. And so they know all the problems. The issue is, you know, where does the urgency come from? And I would say, I would argue that now you should be the most urgent uh, that you've ever been because, you know, you just look at the pace of progress in the open source community, in the AI community, among startups, and it's, it's breakneck. There's literally... Yeah. Uh, and if, there's this weird thing that's happened, which is that a lot of stuff was invented in the key universities. Yeah. Then companies like Google essentially acquired those teams, yeah. right, as either through startups or by hiring the professors or the graduate students. Essentially, all of the combinatoric innovation is now occurring in these large companies or very, very well-funded startups, mm -hmm. right? That's not the norm. And so what you're seeing now is you're seeing this enormous uh, commercial interest in the big companies, and we can go through the specifics, but you also have the open source community following very fast. So one way to understand is the open source community normally would be ahead, but in this case, it's catching up. But the gap isn't that big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk a bit about that because I'm, you know, we were talking a bit about the Civility AI event earlier this week. Maybe people in this room were there as well. And uh, there was, you know, some direct comments about, you know, the big tech companies. And um, there's also, you know, in my world, which is like, you know, essentially we're maybe the haters, we're the ones who are saying, well, isn't this bad or isn't this gonna cause a problem? And we ask those critical questions. You know, a big one that we're talking about is, you know, proliferation and access and, you know, different Google, when they did their thing and when the big tech companies do their thing, they're careful about what they release, what they don't release. Largely that's for business reasons, but there's also, you know, is this a technology that we want anybody in the world to have immediate access to? And then you have OpenAI's model, which is sort of, to do that a little bit more, but also to be careful about what explicitly they release to the world. And now you have these more, much more open source movements that are saying, look, like we are gonna trust the world and we also don't believe that commercially these things should be controlled by the few, they should be controlled by the many. So, I mean, this is also a big conversation that's happening right now. And I mean, I don't know where you place your company in that or how you think about that. Yeah, well, first off, I, I think it's super interesting. I think a genie's out of the bottle, right? I right. think that uh, be, in, in some part because of these open source efforts, we're in, we're in a world where there's, you know, we're not questioning when AI is going to get to you know, mass adoption it's, or, or if it's going to get to mass adoption, we're questioning when. And, uh, and so I think that's the first major paradigm shift. I think our view is that uh, even with the open source technology, there's still massive gaps and there's still uh, parts of you know, the world, like our, the United States national security enterprise, um, large, these large enterprises that uh, really have not yet adopted much of this technology. You know, there's these massive swaths of the old economy which require access to this technology uh, as urgently as possible. And I think it's, it's necessary for, you know, our view at scale is how can we help bridge that gap mm -hmm. and, and bring these like, breakthroughs to those locations. I mean, it's, it's sort of a related conversation, but Eric, I know in the book that you did recently, there is concern about proliferation and about bad actors having access to this technology. So, I mean, how do you kind of square that risk with the need to get this out to more people and democratize it? I think Alex got it right. Um, I had hoped three or four years ago that the really powerful stuff would stay inside of industrial labs 
and that the people leading it would restrict it. For example, OpenAI did that with GPT-2 for a bit. But I think the sort of cultural pressure and the, uh, the way sort of the, the, I don't know how to describe it, the liberal democ democratic thinking uh, causes this kind of sharing. Uh, and it's often done with a very naive understanding of how these things will be used. Yeah. So you can be sure that the people who invented vision systems did not think that their vision systems would be used by the Chinese to track Uyghurs. Right. Right. It, it was not on the feature list, you know, five years ago. Yeah. They were building this for this. And so if I were one of those developers, I'd be embarrassed that my technology had been misused. I guess you could say the same thing about the telephone. But the important thing is it's naive. And I want to be very clear. It's naive to assume that this technology is not going to be used by evil people right, to, to somehow trust the community. Well, unfortunately, the community, there, if it's a large enough community, there is at least one bad actor. And let me give you a couple of examples. A bad actor could easily weaponize the generation of malevolent viruses mm -hmm. using basically the, the transformer tools that, that are now so popular, plus a large database of biology. Um, another bad actor could easily use these tools to do highly targeted um, uh, offensive attacks on specific individuals. Um, uh, a bad actor could use these to generate very manipulative disinformation mm -hmm. to change a society, to change an outcome, to cause a riot, to cause people to be killed, right? So I'm not suggesting we shouldn't build it, but I would like people to say, we're building this amazing platform, comma, we need to figure out a way to keep this under control, to detect it, to police it, or to monitor it. Right. And relatedly, you know, um, a good friend of ours, Jared Cohen, <clears throat> I was talking to him about this recently, that I think technologists need to go undergo geopolitical training, just in the same way that they go through other trainings for, uh, for their job. Because you know, uh, he, he mentioned this story around uh, Ian Goodfellow, who's the inventor of the uh, GAN, the General Adversarial Network, mm -hmm. which was the precursor to a lot of the, the um, diffusion models and image generation models we have today. And he, uh, you know, obviously this technology is very exciting, it's very interesting, it's very cool. Um, he brought Ian to speak to uh, former Russian and Chinese intelligence uh, analysts. And, he, and he, had, he asked them, you know, what could uh, this, these image generation models be used for? How are the Russians going to use them? How are the Chinese going to use them? And what are the, the negative externalities of those? And I think that level of understanding and, frankly, awareness is really necessary as the technology continues improving and getting better. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you have government clients, right, at this point? I mean, so, like, do you, when you have conversations with them, I mean, and whether it's the U.S. government or maybe other ones, I mean, are you hearing these concerns? Are they saying, yes, sell to us, but don't sell to X, Y, Z, client or state? Or, like, how do you, I mean, you're having these conversations right now that are business, that are strategic. Who do we want to work with? Who do we not want to work with? Like, how, like, I don't know if you're able to provide any examples, but how are you dealing with those kind of tough conversations right now, or are, are you even having them? You know, I, I think the first one, frankly, was, was our strong commitment to United States national security. Um, and, uh, and we made that decision because, you know, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the atomic bomb was first built, you know, the Manhattan Project, which I think is a, a very important lesson for us all to sort of grok and understand. Um, and, uh, and it was this sort of clear technology breakthrough that had very, very meaningful implications for uh, sort of global affairs and global events over the following decades. And I think that AI technology is a very similar, uh, similar kind of technology, has similar implications for world events, for geopolitics, for, frankly, the, the sort of battle of the free world versus authoritarian regimes. And uh, we made a strong commitment. This was years ago, uh, probably back in 20... Uh, 20, when we made the commitment to work with the United States government and, and use our technology for a strong defense. You know, Eric also has been very deep on this issue, led the, the Defense uh, Innovation Board, among other organizations, and sort of has been mm -hmm. a, a leading voice in this topic of utilizing AI for, for national security. Well, I think that the situation in Ukraine is a really good reminder that we collectively need to be in favor of democracy. Um, and when you look at what's going on in China, and we can get into all of the details of what's going on in China and Russia, um, we really want to be in democracies. So let's start with that. So what we're doing had better be consistent with the principles of democratic rule and leadership and voting and all of those kinds of things. So I always worry when they're not in alignment. Uh, to answer the, Alex's question about his company, for the other companies, 
you would say pretty much everybody now has an AI um, ethics group. And what happens is that they, there's some, some question comes up and it goes to the ethics groups and they decide. Most of the companies that I'm aware of have, uh, uh, they try to not be on the offensive side and they try to be on the defensive side of national security. That's, that's how their AI ethics group come out. The only problem with that is that in, in conflict, uh, defense and offense can often be the same. So this is, these are examples like missile right. defense systems get very tricky because yeah. of that issue. Um, so uh, as part of my work with the military, the, we, we wrote in the military adopted, the US military, an AI ethics for the US military. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, which I'd encourage everyone to read because it's all, it's all in public. So I think it's worth saying AI is important enough that each of us need to have our own sort of AI ethics rule. Mm -hmm. Our corporations, our universities, and our governments need to do it. And I hope that they're consistent with democratic, democratic principles. Right. I mean, you know, like are we in sort of a space race specifically with China when it comes to this technology? Or is that idea a little bit too zero sum and maybe even self-fulfilling? Like are we, are we in this point where, the, you know, there's no going back? You know, it seems that the hedges are going to go a little bit higher and higher with technology. Or, you know, should we kind of pull back the clock 10 years and say, hey, well, technology can be a way to extend American culture and American values. And, you know, maybe we should be careful about how closed off or maybe even how militant we're getting about some of these conversations. I think it's unavoidable. I, I mean, I, I, I do think the hedges keep, keep going up. Part of that is inherent to the technology. So our, one of the big breakthroughs of artificial intelligence of recent years is sort of this realization that uh, scale really matters. Scale, not the company, but scale. I mean, it's a good name, right? So, <laughs> it's a good yeah, name. It's yeah. very relevant. Um, but the, the sort of amount of data you have for these systems, the amount of computational power, the size of the models, you know, all these things really, really matter for the power of your AI systems. And that setup, you know, it's almost like how the size of your uh, nuclear warhead stockpile uh, is, is, a, is a dimension upon which proliferation will, uh, will persist. You know, this is just another example where, you know, the models are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and do more and more incredible things and more and more uh, sort of innovative tasks that have the potential for both good and, and great potential for harm. And so mm -hmm. this sort of race with China or Russia on, on AI, I think, is somewhat unavoidable, partially also due to the values misalignment that, uh, that Eric was mentioning. You know, we, in America, we're going to be thoughtful about using AI for democratic values, but those same values are not present in how China is going to use the technology or Russia is going to use the technology. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, we need to just be real about what that might mean for uh, how the technology will proliferate. Yeah. Yeah. I think a w a, the correct w word is exactly, we've obviously worked together on this for a long time, <laughs> using the same words literally. He's exactly right when he says race. It's a race, not a war. Right? Right. Wars are different. We understand what war is. Yeah. So in not, sometimes people mix those up, right? Yeah, and well, again, yeah. study Ukraine to understand yeah. the, the horror. The, I was just there, yeah, the yeah. horrors of a real war. And, and I say this with great respect to the military uh, leaders that are in the room. Um, the... So, so it's a race for a prize that's important. And that race is to set standards for global information flows and communications around the world. Mm -hmm. um, in that race, we, the United States, have managed to lose the 5G race definitively, um, which is a source of great frustration for me every hour and minute I'm on the freeway. Um, uh, <laughs> An example is I'm in Ukraine and I'm on the train. You can't fly there. And we have a Starlink on the roof of the train and I have 200 megabits. Now remember that the next time you're on an Amtrak train. Um, but getting back to the things we've lost. Yeah, we have we, a low bar for our public infrastructure in this country. Yeah, but why? Yeah. This is the wealthiest and most successful right. country on earth last time I heard about it, which was in grade school, <laughs> uh, which is a long time ago for me. So th look, the important thing is um, in this race, China is a very, very well-organized competitor. They have a model which is called civil-military fusion. What they do is they pick national champions. They give them an enormous amount of money. Um, this, is not, this conference is not about quantum, but quantum is now getting three times, five times, ten times more funding in China than it is in the West, right? 
and we know it's just at the beginning of, of its implications, all sorts of national security issues. So the, a thought experiment to think about is, let's imagine that in five or 10 years, whatever time frame you choose, we have a system which is partial AGI. You know, it's capable of setting some objectives, it's interesting, and so forth. How would you feel if it was a Manhattan Project with your background, but one run in China, mm -hmm. right? You'd be pretty upset, right? We want, to be, we want to make sure that if there's any chance for that kind of technology, we want it to be built in the West and controlled by the West. Right. Um, I'm going to go to questions in a minute, so if people want to think about that. But the one thing I wanted to ask before that is, you know, then you just sort of described China's industrial policy about how they're approaching it. And, you know, the state is very involved in that to the point where they may be telling business leaders what to do and what not to do. That's, you know, when it comes to AI regulation specifically, but I'll say tech regulation broadly, U.S. government has not really, hasn't really done anything in the last, um, you know, decade. And so I'm wondering, like, do we need to, should there be more involvement between private companies and the state? Should, um, do we need, you know, specific kinds of regulations, maybe like what, what Europe is doing, prescriptive ideas for how AI should develop? Um, or are we okay with this more kind of open, free market system that, the U.S. has sort of championed and continues to do. I don't know, Alex, because you're in the midst of it, right? So, Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say one area of this where I have a very strong perspective, which is, again, on national security. I think that um, it is, if you look at all these recent AI breakthroughs, or even the AI breakthroughs over the past 20 years, um, the vast majority are American technology. You know, American companies have really uh, built and, and created this incredible technology that has uh, that has, is, is very, very powerful and is going to fundamentally change the world. Um, and then you look at the, the sort of uh, bridging of that gap towards applying to our national security problems, and we're in this strange world where the, uh, the leading organizations that have created a lot of the technology have, have really sort of either refused or just sort of um, you know, abdicated from supporting the, uh, the United States national security uh, objectives. And that fundamentally needs to change. We need, you know, I think, uh, I think there was an event called uh, The Hill and the Valley. We need to bring these two communities very deeply together. And the most innovative technologists need to be thinking about how can the technology be used for United States national security objectives and, and bringing this technology for use, for defense, for intelligence, for all these purposes. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, uh, we were at great risk. And so I think on this dimension in particular, I think it's absolutely critical. And I think that, you know, um, the nature of the technology, last piece on this, is that it's massively acceleratory. Just like how the internet in the early days up until now has felt like this sort of unending, you know, ever faster treadmill of, of sort of technology and pace. And AI is going to be no different. And so every waking week, month, year that we don't take action, is is an op, is sort of uh, a missed opportunity or mortgaging our future in in ensuring that we have access to the best technology. There's a tendency for the people who think they're winning the race to then declare success and stop competing. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at what China's doing, and to some degree Russia, but really China, this race is going to go on for a long time. So it's really important when we develop these new platforms that we keep innovating, right? The, there's lots of good news here. There's lots of money in the industry. There's lots of really smart people coming in. The number one major in all the leading universities is now computer science, and a lot of them are doing AI, ML, and so forth. So we have sort of the generational shift that we need. But in our political system, I'll give you an example, USICO, which formerly the CHIPS Act, $250 billion. We're gonna need another one of those every few years because we're gonna need more government funding and participation to move these key industries forward. It won't happen just by universities and private sector. That's an example of how you have to fight and win. But we can win this. Yeah, but we, we do need more public funding and more government money as, as well. Okay. Um, do, do we have any questions? Do we have a mic that we're, I know we were kind of doing it on the fly, so I want to make sure there is actually a mic that's going around. But um, We have a question right here in the front. Um, Okay, go for it. Yeah, I guess just I'll we'll have to repeat yeah, your question. Yeah. Oh, and then I'll do over there next. We have a mic. Yeah, it's okay. Just so everyone can hear you, right here. Okay. And then we'll go to this one next. Yeah. Uh, Alexander Demling, I work for the Spiegel German magazine, and I, I was wondering, 
Um, how much of the regulation you're talking about, about the kind of work, military, uh, private sector, how much is, now that we've seen with this Russia-Ukrainian war, how the West is threatened in our, in our security, how much is possible on a NATO level, like cooperation between nations, and how much needs to be in the U.S. in your, and with the, like, the U.S. military? Um, well, first place, the, the, the U.S. military is doing lots of stuff using AI. Uh, let's start with Project Maven, uh, which involves better vision systems and, and these sorts of things, better signals intelligence. I was just in Ukraine. And I wanted this, one of the things I wanted to see was how did the tech industry, what did it do? And uh, in this particular case, Starlink really made a difference because it allowed the Russians blockage of the various internet ports not to happen. They put everything in the cloud in day one. It was illegal to put stuff in the cloud if you were Ukraine, in Ukraine, and they changed that in one day in case the country was overrun. And then they built an app called DIA, D-I-I-A, which is basically a sort of think of it as a passport app. And they put in an ability to take a picture which is geolocated, and they have good things to uh, address false use and so forth. And you submit the picture. It's classified using a tank classifier, essentially. What kind of tank is it? They, ge they geolocate where the tank is, and then a human makes a targeting decision. So that's an example where <clears throat> the technology is used in a very straightforward way to help, to help them fight, essentially defend themselves. I think from the standpoint of the Ukrainians, they have this extraordinary technical capability for all sorts of reasons. And they've also been under attack from the Russians for basically since before 2014. So I think they're going to do fine, right, if we continue to help them with the kind of information that they need. The question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Loretta Tivarela. Uh, I'm actually a founding and managing partner at Next Sequence. You have mentioned technologies like AI, uh, but also uh, now actually quantum computing. Uh, what is your view about tech bio and what it means uh, in terms of the future of tech bio? Where do you think the industry going and what is actually missing to make it as important on the agenda as AI or quantum computing? Alex? Yeah, I think, um, well, I think that the really interesting thing, again, going back to this concept of AI as a platform technology, has been the, uh, is the ability to utilize AI as a tool to progress, you know, virtually every other industry. But biotechnology, I think, is one great example where artificial intelligence is having a very meaningful impact. You know, um, DeepMind released uh, their AlphaFold protein folding uh, algorithm, and then I believe earlier this, this year they released a database of, I think it was 400 million proteins, but basically the universe of all proteins that we as human know of, uh, folded by AlphaFold. And so we're at this point where, and, and if you talk to Demis at DeepMind, you know, one of the things he's very passionate about is AI as a tool to accelerate all of human science. Um, and, and frankly, AI being this, this tool that's going to allow us to, to sort of solve science to a, to a large degree. And so I think that th this is like the right way to think about it is, almost in the same way that the microscope accelerated science or the computer accelerated science, we now have this new tool, artificial intelligence, that's going to massively accelerate outcomes in biotechnology and make it so that we're, um, we're going to, I, I truly believe, do a much better job at identifying new treatments, um, being able to do better uh, drug discovery and, and other sorts of uh, advancements in the field. Um, I can give you an example of chemists. <clears throat> so you talk to a chemist, what do chemists do all day? They basically organize things in these complicated chemistry sets, right? And they all have complicated relationships of energy and bindings and so forth. And what they want is they want their computer to help them do that. And these tools allow them to do that very quickly. But more interestingly, once they get something that works, you can, for example, use quantum simulation and eventually quantum computers to sort of optimize the, essentially the low point of the energy state of this particular thing. You can actually make it more buildable, more effective, and more sort of reliable, if you will. Uh, in, and the chemistry terms are, are more complicated, but you get the idea. So that's a good example where the underlying science platform that you're describing really affects your life. Because you will eventually, ha as a result, have a better material, a better liquid, a better substance, something better on the supermarket shelves, or in your home, or on the floor, or in your car, or whatever, because of that. Um, Synthetic biology 
is probably the next really big one. And the simplest way to understand it is the people who are in synthetic biology think that 60 to 70% of the built world can be grown instead of built, grown and grown in ways that are more um, climate friendly, if you will. So you can grow concrete and bricks. Today, there's lots of synthetic biology around drugs and perfumes and liquids and things like that, biofuels and so forth. So uh, the Biden administration has, has a whole SynBio program. A couple billion dollars have been applied to that. That's another big one coming. Uh, we have one right here, question right here. Hi. Oh. I'm uh, Nicholas Bergam Adams. You, you can go next, but he'll go. Uh, I'm Nicholas Bergam Adams from Goodly Labs. Um, I really appreciate the concern about geopolitics um, and, and the idea that we're in this race or this rivalry that's, that's so important. Um, I wonder if there's another front in which to engage that um, and, and your thoughts about it. So uh, apart from the military front, it seems like it's plausible that some of these technologies and some of this perspective could be used to um, kind of support and uh, pro-social technologies, uh, tools and, and technologies that kind of produce the precursors of democratic culture and spread that at scale. Um, with internet communications technology and some of these exponential AI technologies. I'm wondering if you have, you have thoughts about that. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, I think it's, it's a really interesting idea, and I think one of the, the core concepts here that is actually one that I'm, I'm quite excited about personally is the uh, util utilization of artificial intelligence for education. And, um, you know, uh, anyone can play with one of these sort of large language models and realize that they're pretty powerful. They're they're reasonably conversant, and um, and there's a there's a pretty immense potential for them to serve as sort of uh, a scalable way to massively increase the bar of education globally. And I think that you know, um, speaking of precursors for for dem democratic ideals or or pro social ideas, I think that that really begins with education and an understanding of you know these different uh, ways of, of humans to organize and what the implications of those, uh, of those uh, methods are. And so, you know, I think one area that, I, that, you know, education in general from a technology perspective has been horribly, horribly underinvested in. Um, but the, art, the utilization of artificial intelligence to offer more scalable, better, and more personalized education, I think is, is a massive change that's going to fundamentally change the curve of human potential over the next, you know, call it five years. Exactly right. <laughs> yep. Hi, my name is Stephanie Schur. Uh, could you perhaps speak a bit on the role of chip production on the global AI race? Um, and then what you see happening on the political front, maybe uh, specifically starting with TSMC? Um, so um, to review the facts at the moment, um, TSMC is making five nanometer chips and is announced four nanometer chips, which are in production now. Um, a, somebody bought a, essentially a, a mining computer that was, had a um, SMIC chip, which is a Chinese chip. And this particular chip, which is a specialized chip, used what appears to be a copy of the seven nanometer TSMC um, uh, ma manufacturing, which is done by an earlier technology of manufacture than the current five nanometer ones. Um, this was a shock to a lot of people. SMIC has since announced that they're going to offer five nanometer chips in the next year. So a reasonable prediction is that if the ASML block holds, which is likely to, for the next few years, China will be in the five nanometer world and the West will be in the four, three, and eventually two nanometers. Um, which is where Intel is trying to go in their Ohio plant, um, as best I can figure it out. So is that enough of a difference to make a big difference? Well, here are, here are the numbers. The vast majority of chips and chip packaging and so forth are made in China, not the chips themselves, but everything else around it. And uh, most of the chips that we use every day are much slower, that is, m greater nanometers than five and nanometers. So as much as we worked hard to reshore High, high skills chip manufacturing into the United States, the fact of the matter is the Chinese have gotten close enough that it's, it's, a, it's a serious race. I think the best thing to do, and part of the CHIPS Act has this in it, is to try to figure out a way to change the design tools 
um, to use AI in the layout and also do 3D packaging of the chips. And the combination of changing the layouts and the 3D packaging can probably give us a step up, again, in the race. But again, these are controversial ideas. Hi. Uh, so this is a question for Eric. Uh, so in, in macroeconomics, we have the Federal Reserve, which is a very, very competent body of uh, PhDs and others. Uh, when radio and television came about, we, we had the FCC and so on. Uh, what's your take on institutionally where the country is missing out? Uh, so we can do legislation after legislation like the CHIPS, et cetera, but what would be your prescription institutionally? Like what institutions need to come to existence uh, to, uh, for us to be a serious player in AI globally? Well, first we are the serious player in AI, so we've done a good job in the current structure. Um, this, the, your question is usually interpreted as, do we need a Department of Internet Regulation? And the industry's answer is no. The existing regulatory bodies, which includes the SEC, the F FTC, the, you know, there's a long list, um, uh, are sufficient. The Europeans disagree with that, and they, they now have the digital, basically the digital services agreements and so forth to try to regulate it further. Um, I've been trying to come up with, if I were God, which I'm not going to be, and I'm not today, how would I do this? And I've not been able to write down, personally, a, a rule that both captures the frustrations that we all have about the internet, but also is not amenable to political challenge, mission creep, and or violations of the Constitution. So let's give you an example. Let's say you don't like the way social media works, which many people don't. Try to write down the algorithm that you would have them use instead of the one they do. Okay, well, that's hard, but let's say you do that. Now, given that the company doesn't want to do that, try to reg write the regulation that enforces them to implement that rule in such a way that future politicians don't change it, right? And we don't have an answer to that. This stuff is too new. We don't have a consensus on what makes sense. And furthermore, since I'm not God, and our political system is clearly broken, you have to come up with the nanosecond in our society where the Republicans and the Democrats agree on anything, right? And at that nanosecond, you have to hand them this piece of paper, and they have to say, this is our only choice. We have to do it because we only have one cent nanosecond to regulate this industry. And I think that's where we are. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, trying to report on AI or any tech regulation sounds about right. It's kind of like, why are we doing I have, I, I, have, I have one more obnoxious comment. Yeah. I think we should, sorry, I think we should rename the word regulation to regulation and growth. If you look at what the Europeans have done, they've managed to have a typical European Brussels process. You can tell I've spent a decade trying to deal with Brussels, and I have some scars, <laughs> uh, which takes forever and is very complicated and very painful. And... The problem is they're trying to regulate AI, but they're not growing in AI. They're regulating the other countries. They're not regulating their own because they're not doing the innovation. What they should have done is they should have had a growth and regulation team. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to be the chairman of the National Security Commission on AI, and we had the dual goal. And so we studied the question of how to grow. Right? And by the way, the best way to grow is to let foreigners who don't want to work in China come and work in the United States in our companies. Right? This is not that complicated, right? It's the first thing. And I can go on, but something like 65% of the innovators in the top pages are all foreign born, right? I'm sorry, Americans. The other people are smarter than we are. It's okay, we let them in. That's how we all got here in the first place. It's a nation of immigrants, and I can go on. Uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, as an H1B holder, I, I, if y'all can figure that out, I'd really appreciate it. Um, or you can come visit me in Canada next year. But um, do we have maybe one more question in the audience? And then where's the, the mic holders? Yeah, is down here? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Eric. I actually agree with you. I think education seems to be the biggest problem in the United States. So do you have any insight how we can actually make United education system, especially before the college, make that more effective and bring in more STEM students. Uh, it's a, it's a big topic. I mean, I think that like um, 
you know, it's clear that there's other other uh, systems of education that are that are better than the American system. But I actually don't think the right approach necessarily is to sort of try to replicate those systems. Um, I think the I think the best approach in this case is to try to race ahead technologically. And so, you know, I think again, just to sort of paint the vision, you know, if there were a world where there were an AI assistant that sort of uh, was able to perfectly pace your educational journey and understand exactly the areas that are giving you trouble in learning any sort of topic and then help you along those nuances and dramatically reduce, reduce the frustration in the process of learning anything new, I think, that's a, I think that's a very compelling vision. I think that's going to result in you know, humans learning far more than they do today and it's going to result in a, in a far less frustrating um, educational process. And so, you know, in this case, I'm a, I'm a full tech optimist where I believe that, um, you know, there's lots of issues in the current education system. There's a lot of sort of local minima that we're in um, in terms of regulation as well as, uh, as well as how a lot of the system works. But I think that the best approach is going to be one of, of technological progress. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, one of the things I want, like that, that you know, the challenge from my end is kind of explaining a lot of the stuff to regular people and meeting them where they're at while also not oversimplifying and also not hyping things up too much. And I think some of the, um, you know, the image models that we've seen with DALI and with Stability AI has really blown that into the public in a new way. And, you know, people might see these images and then you have to tell them, yeah, like a, a machine made that and they still don't, they're like, wait, what do you mean? And, but I found it to be a really useful way into talking to regular people who don't come to AI conferences about AI. And I'm just wondering what, you know, what the, what the two of you think about, you know, where is the general public at? Is there, are there ways that as a community we can be better to help people understand in an accurate way what AI is and what it means for their lives and, and what they should know about it or prepare for it? Eric, you're the expert. Well, pe people tend to learn from fear examples, like, you know, what happens if, what happens right. if. But I think you're much better off with the positive examples. Mm -hmm. Like, everyone can be an artist. Everyone can be a musician. I mean, there are very few really talented people like me. You know, like, I'm not talented in this area, but I can be almost as talented as a famous person. That would be fun for me. Right. right? I was thinking about a presentation where I want to do a, a, a picture involving drones in an unusual thing, and I thought, I'll just have Dolly 2 do it rather than me because it'll take me forever yeah. to try to draw it out, and it'll look terrible. So I think once it becomes part of your daily life, Right, it isn't magic. So think about, think about where we are now. I was thinking about it as coming up to San Francisco because I've lived in the Bay Area for 45, 45 years. Right, as I come up to the Bay Area, come up 101, I'm on my computer, on a fast network, working on these hard problems. People are sending me all sorts of attachments. I have all these dynamic things going on in my workspace and I've got all these people texting me and so forth at the same time. When did this happen? When did I lose control over my commute? And the answer is when the phone showed up, because the phone was personal. And we, we, we don't remember a time when we didn't have smartphones, and yet they're only 14 years old. And the first ones were not nearly as useful, and it wasn't until 2000, uh, roughly 10 years ago when the app stores and these things took off. It was only about five years ago when this kind of image modeling stuff really played out. It's that new. Right. I made my Halloween party invite with Dolly, too. Looks, yeah, I don't know. But I, I'm still not very good at like prompting those things yet. But it turns I'm out the pro there. they're very sensitive to the quality. They are, of yeah. That, I mean, that's where the skill comes in, right? That's where no, the no, they're, they're going to be a yeah. machine learning model that takes yeah. your prompt and generates a correct prompt. Yeah, <laughs> right. I know how AI people think. I don't know how to invent that, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, you interact. You have to deal with you, or not deal with, but you I mean, you sell to people who aren't experts, who aren't technical. I mean, how do you think about that question? Yeah, I think that I think the big thing is almost like uh, very similar to what Eric was saying. You know, the use cases for artificial intelligence in your life have almost nothing to do with the underlying technology. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, usually we're talking about neural network-based architectures that do incredible things with with sort of unstructured data. But that you know, the, the underlying, as with any technology, the underlying technological implementation has nothing to do with how it's what the place it's going to have in our lives. And I think that you know, it's going to do everything from make it easier to communicate with people and, and sort of have live translation with you know, the people you care about the most, all the way to this sort of like uh, unleashing of, of creativity, mm -hmm. be these image generation models, to all of a sudden uh, enabling us all to be great writers with, with these sort of like writing tools. Mm -hmm. And each of these things are, are different 
use cases and different value propositions to us as humans, which means I think, you know, frankly, it's going to be woven into our daily lives much like the internet has. You know, we're going to have an app like Uber and an app like Instagram and an app like Twitter, and these all occupy different spaces in our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, generative design is going to have a lot of implications. If we go back to the Uber re revolution, sort of we started with smartphones, you know, a little bit more than 10 years ago here in San Francisco. I think the next one is going to be about generating things that are not physically possible. Um, the most obvious ones are basically deep fakes of people who are no longer with you, right, where you can almost talk to them uh, and show your grandchild what your grandfather sounded like. Yeah. And these kinds of things, when they happen and they're coming pretty fast, people are going to notice, because that's something you just can't do. Yeah. If you go back to, you know, Amazon was the world's largest bookstore, and it was bigger than any physical bookstore. And I remember when Amazon, that's a really cool idea, right? So there are going to be ideas of that scale that will affect people every day. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we're right at time, so thank you both very much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, so thank you Alex. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.